Hello, and welcome to nature. The conservationists call it the wall of death. It's the most efficient, yet the most controversial method of high seas fishing devised by man. This week, the European Fisheries Commission meet to discuss a drift net ban for the Atlantic, and this is what they're talking about a section of drift net that was washed up on the coast of Alaska. It was once part of a huge nylon wall that stretched for at least 30 miles. It's invisible to fish. They become trapped by their gills. The openings are too small for them to swim through. Larger animals, whales, dolphins and seabirds, become cocooned in the nylon. In Britain, some importers now label their tuna as dolphin friendly. They check their suppliers to ensure that no drift nets are used. And yet, the drift net fleets are still at sea, as Triona Holden reports. Drift nets are used in almost every ocean. Fishermen cast more than 24,000 miles a night, enough to encircle the world. They're used to catch tuna in the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean, and a variety of fish in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. The biggest fleet, roughly 800 vessels from Japan, Taiwan and Korea, plies the waters of the North Pacific, in search of squid. Here in Alaska, life revolves around the North Pacific. Beyond that horizon is the world's biggest and most abundant fishing grounds. But there are growing concerns that those rich resources are threatened. These are the latest pictures of the North Pacific Driftnet fleet in action. Greenpeace footage taken this summer shows how effectively the nets left out overnight catch their quarry, red squid. In the morning, the creatures hang in the water, entangled in a ghostly nylon curtain. Their instinctive attempts to escape behind a cloud of ink are useless. But the nets catch much more than squid. Marine mammals, known as cetaceans, need air to breathe. Trapped in the mesh, unable to surface, they drown. Seabirds attracted by fish caught in the net suffer a similar fate. Drift nets have been used for centuries, but it's only in the past 35 years that the development of nylon nets has made them more attractive to fishermen. They're cheap, strong and incredibly efficient. It's very easy to understand once you see these nets underwater just how deadly they are to marine life. They're very much like curtains of gossamer. Uh, they're almost impossible to see even in broad daylight uh, 20 feet away underwater. They don't show up on cetacean sonar and they have this tendency to collapse uh, around whatever they come into contact with. Um, the first time I brushed up against one of these nets, it was, it was this very sort of insidious, clingy material, and it took me about five minutes to actually cut myself free. There's just simply no justification, uh, economic or otherwise, for destroying the environment for the sake of short-term economic gain. Uh, certainly, I don't think these fishermen are so ignorant or, or disempowered that they cannot uh, use other fishing technologies that are environmentally sustainable, that have been actually used for centuries, if not millennia, like... Uh, pole fishing, long lining, trolling, uh, purse staining on specific schools of, of specific species. Uh, these are the types of technologies that are environmentally sustainable, that can be used, or have been almost used exclusively throughout the world until about 10 years ago. Um, the only excuse uh, for drift net fishing is unparalleled greed and, and laziness. Sam Labuddy and Earth Trust decided that a war of words wasn't enough to drive their message home. So just over a year ago, they produced a tough documentary-style video, illustrating what they described as the strip mining of the oceans. Its disturbing images alerted the world to what was happening on the high seas. What you are seeing now is a baby common dolphin that died of suffocation after being entangled in an invisible drift net. Each year, this scene is repeated tens or perhaps hundreds of thousands of times. In addition, many thousands of seabirds are caught and drowned in these nets as they dive for food. Despite their size, even the great whales are not safe from the dangers of the drift nets, and untold numbers perish annually during their migrations through the fishing grounds. If something isn't done soon, the late 20th century may be remembered as the time when the resources of the Pacific were destroyed. The Japanese were furious about the film. They said facts were inaccurate or distorted. It was nothing more than misleading propaganda. It sparked a kind of video wars because the Japanese fishermen had their own film made in response, using Earth Trust pictures but putting on their own commentary. 
The current hysteria over drift nets was generated by self-serving fisheries interests in the United States and the Southwest Pacific. Unfortunately, some otherwise well-meaning environmental organizations mistook propaganda for fact and misguidedly embraced the cause. The key propaganda vehicle was a television documentary sponsored by Alaskan and Northwest fishermen. After sailing 1,500 miles to film Taiwanese squid drift net fishing and sending their photographers underwater to film all along the nets, the most they could show was some small tuna and a single dolphin caught in the nets. The Earth Trust video was, is a video that was produced by a special interest group, an environmental group. It has a very acute objective on this particular issue, and that is to eliminate drift nets. The group, I will give them very, very good, uh, strong credit for raising environmental concern, because there are environmental problems with this fishery that have to be addressed. But the video also, in order to promote its cause, as I see it, includes quite a bit of misinformation. And this misinformation is intended to arouse the emotions of the people against the fishery, and even possibly against the people who conduct this fishery. And this is what really worries me, and what skews the issue from a one of scientific objectivity to one of emotion and politics. The driftnet vessels themselves are providing the answers to resolve this bitter stalemate about basic facts. Does the fleet seriously threaten marine mammals? Is it overfishing, destroying the ocean's resources? U.S. and Canadian scientists have been on board 61 driftnet ships, counting the casualties as the catch was hauled in. It's a job U.S. biologist Thomas Jefferson did in the 80s with the Japanese salmon driftnet fleet. I've worked for National Marine Fisheries Service twice with these type of issues, and both times I was, I was strongly encouraged not to talk to reporters, not to talk to lawyers, um, essentially to, to be quiet about what I had seen out there. Um, and I have not really respected that because I feel that it's important for people to know what's going on out there. It's a serious uh, conservation problem and in order for anything to ever get done about it, people have got to know that the problem exists. I was uh, very surprised with what I saw when I went out as an observer in 1985. I'd had some previous experience with, with this fishery, some, some knowledge from uh, papers that I'd read and research that I'd, been, that I'd done, specifically on doll's porpoise. But I wasn't prepared for how many um, animals I saw caught in the nets, especially animals like, like seabirds, various types of seabirds, uh, shearwaters, and various types of, of ox or alcids, uh, murres, puffins, murrelets, uh, auklets, those type of animals. And essentially what I, what I realized from going out there and what I've, I've learned since then is that these nets are very non-selective and anything that's large enough to get caught in the mesh size of the net apparently does. There may be a day in the future when um, we can find ways of using this type of technology, of using drift nets, and not killing large numbers of seabirds and dolphins and porpoises and other animals. But um, the way the situation is today, I think the drift nets have got to go. Last year, observers on just 27 Japanese ships from the squid fleet counted more than 900 dolphins and over 9,000 seabirds drowned in the nets. At that rate, the death toll for the whole fleet would have amounted to a staggering 100,000 dolphins and almost a million birds. This observer program last year, and I believe that the United States scientists would agree, was not intended to be a statistically reliable program. What it was intended to do was to go out and get a feeling for the fishery, to get a feeling of how to set up a better program this year in order to get, start gaining statistically reliable data. I believe also, the scientists would probably say that it's inappropriate to try and extrapolate or estimate totals from these particular figures that came in last year. It's very easy to study things to death, and I, uh, I, I personally am, uh, am, am losing a bit of patience with scientists that want things uh, cut and dry and, and painted uh, and, and, and written in cement before they can, they can say yes or no, this is damaging. Uh, the fact is that studying drift nets is not going to tell us anything that we don't already know. There is no proof in science. You just finally get enough data that, uh, that you're, you're most, more sure than you unsure of what the facts are. And uh, anybody that's done their homework on drift netting uh, will tell you that um, they're the most destructive fishing technology that's ever been devised by man. Environmentalists have found their most unlikely allies in the fishing industry itself. The idyllic morning calm of the waterfront at Ketchikan in Alaska is merely a facade. The people of this rugged outpost, who've relied on salmon fishing for generations, have declared war on the driftnet fishermen in the North Pacific. 
Alaskans blame squid drift netters turned pirate for a dramatic fall in the returns of their salmon. The industry is worth an estimated five billion dollars a year. It provides jobs and revenue for fishing communities. The salmon migrate back to US waters from the ocean. Legally, they're owned by their country of origin. There's evidence, though, the American fish are being intercepted by pirates. Driftnet marked salmon turn up in every catch. You can tell these have been intercepted at the high seas for the size and the age of the uh, net marks. They're a lot smaller than the nets we use around here, and they're healed over. If uh, these marks were caused by fishing around here, with our nets, there would be uh, open wounds, a lot fresher. It affects our business because what we do is process fish. Without fish, we don't have anything to do. The fishermen don't have anything to do. We're not going to have a livelihood. In the last 10 years, millions of dollars have been plowed into Alaska's salmon farming industry. Hatcheries have been established throughout the state. It's known as salmon ranching. Year-old fish are released to travel to the ocean. Four years later, the adult fish make a remarkable journey. Using a sense of smell and taste, they're able to return and spawn in the very pens where they began life. Alaskans say pirates have had an impact on both wild and farm stocks. Two years ago, only a quarter of the pink salmon returned. Last year, the catch of pinks was back to normal, but other species are still being hit. Pink salmon are only one of the five Pacific salmon in our area. We have coho, chum salmon, chinook salmon, and sockeye salmon. Uh, these are still being impacted. Because you have one species that come through one year, you can't say the problem's over. And when we put this amount of economic effort into the kind of activities that we have here uh, and then see somebody else reap the benefit of that is what really makes it hurt. It'd be similar to the farmer that plants the field out there and have somebody else come in and harvest his crop for him and he gets no benefit from it. Clear number four engine. Number four is clear. 34. Catching the pirates means grueling airborne patrols for the Coast Guard, flying low level for many hours over some of the most hostile waters of the world. Coast Guard officers and a team of special agents from the US government have a near impossible task to police an area larger than the USA itself patrolling two million square miles of ocean, trying to pinpoint vessels straying out of the legal fishing zone. The things that we're looking for when we make our flyby is to identify the vessel as to country of origin, uh, the activity of the vessel, and what species of uh, fish or other animals that are being uh, taken aboard the vessels. They're up against organized crime on a huge scale. Their arrests can trigger diplomatic repercussions around the world. Polynair, we have a target, 40 miles, 16 degrees left of the nose. Got him in sight. Yes, sir. Right here, 40. About the right size.